So our next speaker is Thomas Grimm from Utrecht, and he will tell us about Hodge theory and the minimal structure for the string landscape. Go ahead, please. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's great to talk here. I have to admit I'm uh, on vacation with my family, and uh, so I'm also in a vacation home, and I hope my internet is, is stable, and um, please let me know if there is some uh, major interruption. So my talk will be about uh, Hodge theory and the structure of the string landscape, and it will be based on a, a number of papers. One paper appeared last fall, and then a number of papers uh, joined with um, uh, my Utrecht group with Pries Bastian, Damian van der Heisteg, Eric Blauschin, and then finally a paper which will uh, appear this year with uh, um, three mathematicians, uh, Christian Schnell, Ben Bakker, and uh, Jacob uh, Zimmermann. Um, even so, my talk is a, a natural, in some sense, a natural continuation what we have heard in the first two talks. Uh, our motivation is very different. So in, uh, in the previous talk, we have heard uh, about black holes and um, how, how one studies period integrals in order to um, understand the physics of black holes. The motivation for my talks comes from a different corner namely from the so-called Swampland program. What is the question in the Swampland program? Well, there one wants to identify general principles that have to be satisfied in an effective theory to be compatible with a theory of quantum gravity. So a well-known picture which is often shown in this context is the following. Imagine that you have a set of apparently consistent uh, quantum field theories, then you would expect that there is only a subset of these theories, which were termed the landscape, which, is, which are actually consistent with quantum gravity. But there is another set of theories, which uh, are known as the swampland, which cannot be consistently coupled to uh, quantum gravity. Yeah. And to discover the rules kind of to shape the boundaries of, uh, of this landscape inside the swamp lad, it's, it's a huge program. And it's also obviously very important in order to understand, uh, say, the, uh, the foundations of quantum gravity. So how, how does one proceed in this, uh, in this program? Well, one way to do that is to look at the theory of quantum gravity, which we know, namely string theory, and consider its known effective theories and check what are their universal properties. Yeah. And then take these universal properties abstract from the findings which one has and formulate conjectures which then are claimed to be true more generally. And these conjectures are sometimes called the swampland conjectures. So what is the outline of my talk? Well, I will look at one specific string compactification, which is very much related to what we have heard in the, uh, in the first two talks. Namely, I want to tell you about four lessons about the complex structure moduli space and moduli stabilizations. In other words, I want to tell you some universal features of periods which you find uh, in complex structure moduli spaces. And I will tell you how they influence the scalar potentials which you find in uh, string compactification. And the upshot of this story is, well, in fact, what you find in string theory is remarkably constrained, right? So it's, it's, it's not some generic function which you find and uh, uh, but but rather it's something remarkably constrained. The second part will be about uh, the proof of some very non-trivial finiteness theorem, which uh, which which one formulated in these flux compactifications. And what we will see the upshot of this is that this kind of remarkably constrained structure is just enough to ensure, ensure finiteness properties. And finally, in the last part, I want to 
use this success to argue that um, that maybe the underlying structure of uh, of the string theory landscape, namely of this set of theories which is consistent with quantum gravity, is actually something mathematically well defined, namely an uh, O minimal structure. And just to give you a highlight on, on why I'm coming up with this. In fact, these finite proofs, they use very heavily some recent mathematical breakthroughs on connecting a Hodge theory with, um, with, with these uh, mathematical structures. Okay, uh, let's, get, let's get started flux compactifications and, and some general lessons which we learned about them in, the, in, in recent years. First, I have to define the setting and the setting will be somewhat similar to what we have heard before, but a, 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 bit, more, a bit more general. Namely, we will consider uh, type 2b string theory compactified on a Calabi-Yau manifold, which I call Y3. And instead of choosing one charge, I will choose two charges, which one can do in these flux compactification, two, uh, three form charges. They are quantized, so they're in this quantized cohomology group, and they satisfy a certain condition, namely that their batch product is actually bounded. And these kind of quantized fluxes with this bounded batch product, they are called a background flux. Yeah. And then there is a condition on these uh, background fluxes which define the vacua uh, of this theory in of this theory. What is this uh, vacuum condition? Well, it's a condition stating that the Hodge star acting on a certain form namely uh, this kind of linear combination with complex coefficients is actually giving you just a factor of i. So in fact, it tells you that this G3 is a very specific uh, you know, Hodge component. The interesting thing is that this is a very well studied and there are numerous reviews on the uh, finding these vacua. Furthermore, there exists a lift to Calabria fourfolds, which makes this into an even more uh, compact story. Namely, these three forms can be actually lifted to a quantized four form, G4, and which satisfies this condition. Namely, this is this boundedness condition. And then we have the vacuum condition. So the vacua are defined by the, that the Hodge star acting on G4 is equal to G4. So now you see the I is gone and it's just self-dual, self-dual forms which are quantized, which we want to study. As I mentioned, there are already for quite some years some long and detailed review about these vacua and this kind of configuration. So they are well studied set of n equals to zero and n equals to one vacua. It, they partially fix the complex structure moduli, the back reactions under control, higher derivative corrections are understood and so on. So it's very fair to say that if we want to test any conjecture, then this is probably the best setting to start with. But now let's think about what makes this uh, what makes this setting so difficult to study. Namely, the Hodge star changes over the complex structure moduli space, and therefore it is in general a very complicated function. It is very challenging to uh, to to compute these kind of this behavior globally over the moduli space. So as we have seen in the previous talk, we can compute uh, periods on the moduli space. And this is in fact what you would have to do in order to study, uh, to, to compute the, uh, the Hodge star over the moduli space. Yeah. Now, 
the sw in the Swampland program, we have a somewhat a different point of view on this. So I don't want to look at specific examples. I, so if I find something in the Quintic, then this could be just a feature of the Quintic. What I want to do is I want to study a properties, property on any manifold, not just a specific example. So I cannot compute examples. So I need to find a different approach. And the different approach which I will take here is to note that the complex structure moduli space has boundaries and therefore has asymptotic regions. And the idea is to understand the, the, the structure of the periods in these asymptotic regions in general using some heavy mathematics and then draw general conclusions from that. Okay. Nevertheless, I told you we don't want to look at specific examples, but in order that you get an idea of what I'm doing, let me uh, bring on the screen the moduli space for the, for the quintic. The quintic has three special points, as we have heard in the previous talk, and I highlighted here two of them, the conifold point and the large complex structure point. At these, at these uh, special points in moduli space, your manifold actually becomes singular and very degenerate, right? And that's why you uh, would take these points out of the moduli space, yeah? Because it's not a smooth space anymore. And the asymptotic regions in which we want to generally study the periods are in fact indicated here, namely they are the region close to, to these uh, special points. Let me indicate that of course, we know that at least in the large complex structure regime and maybe in conjectured terms also in some other regimes, there is mirror symmetry to a, a dual description here in the large complex structure regime to the large volume regime of some uh, other geo kind of mirror dual Calabi-Yau manifold. And that means that if I understand all the asymptotic regions in moduli space, I will also understand the large volume regime. Now that this story is not quite as simple as in the quintic in general, you can imagine easily if you look at higher dimensional moduli spaces. Yeah. And I give you here a, a famous example, which are which also from the like previous speakers, namely the moduli space of this mirror of this manifold here. Yeah, of this projective uh, hypersurface in pro projective space. And what you see is that actually, if you have higher dimensional moduli spaces, then your, uh, your, your structure of the boundary of the moduli space is, can be highly complicated. Yeah? So there can be a complete locus for the conifold that the large complex structure point is an intersection between two kind of boundary loci and so on. So, so you can imagine that if we want to understand the boundary structure generally, we have to use quite a, some heavy technology. So this is the uh, this is the this is the aim. We want to have a systematic understanding of the asymptotic moduli space without scanning through explicit example, and we want to identify, for example, the states. State with states, I mean exactly what was uh, what was discussed in the previous uh, talk. That you have some charge vector Q, which specifies, say, a, a black hole state, or we want to have if we want to find flux vacua. This is what I introduced in, uh, in the first few slides. And we want to do this in these asymptotic regions of M. And then given, these, uh, given this, I want, to I want to at best test some of these swampland conjectures. For example, there are many papers now on testing the so-called distance conjecture, also the weak gravity conjecture and so on in these asymptotic regions. I try to collect reference. Uh, yeah, let me let me add uh, let me add a conjecture quickly here just to just to uh, clarify my opinion on these things. Is 
So in order that a swampland conjecture uh, is true, it has to be true in this type to be setting. Uh, I'm adding this here because I, I have a lot of faith in, uh, in testing these swampland conjectures using these, uh, under, this deep understanding of period integrals and so on. And in fact, I'm not alone in this opinion. And there are quite a few papers I didn't succeed in kind of collecting all the references. Uh, there are reviews where you can find uh, a lot of details on this, uh, on these approaches. And I highlight two uh, somewhat different but related approaches uh, here with these two references. What did we do? Well, we used a, a, a part of mathematics, which is known as asymptotic Hodge theory, or just sometimes Hodge theory, um, and applied it and to test and formulate such conjectures. Uh, this started already in 2018 and led us to a couple of uh, 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 papers which I listed here, but I think it is fair to say that only recently, uh, in the last uh, one uh, year or one or two years, we really understood how powerful actually this machinery is. And I hope to convince you in the first part of this talk that this is indeed uh, the case. Now, I want to describe four lessons which we learned in this, in this, uh, in this study. And the, the first lesson is that, in fact, this complicated web of boundaries uh, admits a classification. So you can actually introduce equivalence classes of boundaries and you sort all the boundaries which you possibly can have in complex structure moduli space into them. And how does that work? Well, on each co-dimension n boundary in complex structure moduli space, the middle cohomology, so for Calabiao three form, three folds the three form, uh, the three form cohomology, admits a PQ decomposition and a decomposition into representations of SL2C to the power n, where n is related to the co-dimension of the boundary. So let me give you an example. If I consider a Calabiao threefold, such as the quintic, yeah, and I send one parameter uh, to the boundary, which in the quintic could be, for example, um, the large complex structure point, then at the boundary, so really at the point where the manifold wildly degenerates, there exists a PQ decomposition still, an abstract PQ decomposition of uh, which, which has a, a similar form. And in fact, this PQ decomposition is compatible with an SL2 uh, decomposition. So, so the, the forms even decompose into uh, eigenforms of an SL2C. And this structure extends to multiple uh, parameters, so in, to higher dimensional, higher co-dimensional boundaries, as I indicated in the example with two moduli before. So there were intersecting, there were co-dimension one boundaries, and if you intersect two of them, then you have co-dimension two boundaries. And if you look at co-dimension two boundaries, you need multiple SL2 spins. And in fact, you can associate uh, this to this, uh, there's a well-defined way of associating these labels to these uh, states at the intersect. So the nice thing is therefore that we can perform a classification of boundaries using the SL2 representations and the positivity of, uh, in this case, of the, of the Hodge norm. So this is, this is completely general. It works for every Calabi-Yau manifold, and it's a powerful way of kind of structuring your understanding of the complex structure moduli space. Let me give you uh, an example for Calabi-Yau three-folds, which have H to one equal to one. There are three uh, principal types, and 
you can call them conifold point, uh, Turin degeneration, and large complex structure point, and you can label them. Yeah. The reason why I list this is I want to show to you that this is not just, uh, just words, but it can be done explicitly. So this is all which can, what can happen. And of course, you can have milder singularities which do not appear, which you, you should give also a label. Interestingly, you can extend this to, for example, all cases with H21 equals to two. Yeah. And then what you find is you get in fact 16 possibilities. That's again, this is everything which can occur. And uh, you can again give these 16 possibilities a name. And then if you look into uh, the literature, you of course find that every example which you find on two moduli, in fact, uh, matches into one of these categories. So recently some papers in the swampland context appeared and they did study exactly these type of uh, two-dimensional boundaries. And then there are cyborg witten theories. Uh, when you embed cyborg witten theory into string theory, then you study these type of boundaries. And by mirror symmetry, the last type of boundaries uh, actually appears in the kreutzer skarke list um, for the Kähler um, classes for, for, for the mirror side. So indeed this classification is complete and it's quite uh, strongly uh, constrained by these, uh, by this, um, by this asymptotic Hodge theory technology. So what is it good for this classification? Well, it actually allows you to uh, approximate the Hodge star in any of these regimes by uh, using the SL2 spins. So the Hodge star can now be written by using the SL2 spins in the following fashion. And you see that suddenly the coordinate dependence of the Hodge norm, this is the Hodge norm, is actually explicitly given in terms of the SL2 spins. So forever, for, for whatever boundary you consider, you will find such an expression uh, for the Hodge norm. You can just evaluate it now in every asymptotic regime. This is the leading and most crude approximation, but it's very easy to handle. You see these are just polynomial uh, dependencies of the Hodge norm. What we now understood is that, in fact, the information in asymptotic Hodge theory is much, uh, it's, it's much stronger. So in fact, you can, in any asymptotic regime, you can reconstruct the, the periods, the actual periods near the boundaries. Namely, you need the SL2 data and the PQ decomposition, which is classified and rather simple and admit simple normal forms. And uh, you have to supply something which is very complicated, but you, you, uh, you can, uh, in, in general construction, you can parameterize by free parameters. Namely, you have to supply a chain of what, uh, what I call phase operators, delta. Now you can use the most general ansatz compatible with the other boundary conditions. And then you can try to reconstruct the periods in all two moduli examples. And uh, this is what we did in this recent paper. And in fact, it is using some of these uh, famous uh, asymptotic Hodge theory techniques, which come from these papers, which I listed here. What, what do I mean by reconstructing the periods? Well, we find that you can reconstruct the periods with some polynomial and some essential exponential corrections. In fact, away from the large complex structure point, the, so the point of maximal unipotency, you always have exponential corrections. And asymptotic Hodge theory can capture these, uh, can capture these essential exponential corrections. And so that this indeed works in practice, let me give you some examples. 
namely I take from my list of classified two dimensional boundaries, I take um, these three, and then you see that the periods near these boundaries are taking always this form, but you have some free coefficients a, b, and so on, and also integer coefficients k1 and k2. And these integer coefficients we can only, and also a and b, we can constrain to some extent, but we cannot fully fix them, right? So if you want to fully fix them, you have to look at a certain example, and then you can find that they have certain properties. Yeah. So some of the amazing properties which we have seen in the previous two talks, they are now in these coefficients, which are, uh, which are just real numbers in our case, or, or kind of some uh, integer numbers when, if they are coefficients. So this is an infinite finite distance singularity and for infinite distance singularities or infinite distance boundaries, you can do the same thing. Now, the last lesson I want to tell you is about uh, moduli stabilization. Now, if you know that you can reconstruct everything from the boundary, why not use this in order to study uh, the vacua of, of, these, uh, of, this, of, of a given flux? Or if you want, relating to the previous talk, say attractor flows, yeah? So what would be the idea? The idea would be to successively work starting at the boundary. So the crudest approximation is this SL2 approximation. In very everything in this approximation, the Hodge star is very simple, namely it's polynomial. It's the leading parts of the Hodge star. And then you can go a little bit deeper in the, in the moduli space, or you can say you add more corrections to your, uh, to your, your stabilization product, uh, problem, and you go to the asymptotic periods with essential exponential cor corrections in mathematical terms. That means that you work with the nilpotent orbit. And finally, the last step would be to use the full periods, including all exponential corrections, which of course is hard in practice. But in this case, you would find exact value. So the nice thing is you can then discover a, a systematic in systematics and moduli stabilization. Why is this nice? Well, it gives you a completely algorithmic approach to stabilize moduli and you find abstract results. And if you want to consider examples, you will find a favorable numeric, right? Because you, uh, you actually go, you add really properly add corrections step by step. And it's very hard to formulate this in general otherwise. It, it, it's, an, it's a natural way uh, to implement hierarchies. And the nice thing is you can also do that for a large number of uh, moduli, so a large number, a large dimension of the moduli space. And so you can uh, kind, of, kind of address some of these recent conjectures which are claimed to hold only for a large number of fields. Now, what I want to show you next is that this technology is, uh, is this asymptotic Hodge theory technology is particularly useful also if you want to prove things because then you can do it for every example and in every limit. And so you can prove the finiteness of self-dual flux vacuum. So let me uh, recall what is the, what are self-dual flux vacua. These are the vacua where G4 is quantized in this cohomology group, they are self-dual and and this is very important for the finiteness, there is this tadpole condition, uh, which is uh, specified here, namely that this product is bounded. I will fix the Calabi-Yau manifold in this discussion. So when I talk about finitely many solutions, I assume or uh, kind of just talk about one Calabi-Yau manifold or, to, or assume that there are finitely many Calabi-Yau manifolds. I will not prove to you that there are finitely many. So there is a lot of evidence that there are only finitely many solutions, but uh, the proof has not been uh, mathematically rigorously carried out. Well, what would be the first idea? Well, you would the first idea would be to 
to show on that you on every path to every boundary only finitely many vacua can occur. This can be done for co-dimension one boundaries with, where only one coordinate is sent to the limit if you use the full power of this SL2 asymptotic techniques. And you can, if you want to understand it, you can read my paper from last year. So it's already quite complicated to do it there, but it's in no comparison to the general case. The general case is orders of magnitudes more complicated. As you can imagine that the number of paths to the boundary increases uh, dramatically if you increase the co-dimension or uh, yeah, the co-dimension of the bound. Now, uh, for SUSY fluxes, so for 2,2 fluxes, um, it has been proven. Yeah, it has been proved that there are only finitely many solutions. And in fact, it has been proved in a very famous, by, by, by applying a very famous theory, theorem by Catani, Delin, and Kaplan. And this paper is, in fact, uh, often considered to be the strongest evidence for the, for the Hodge conjecture. And what do they do? Well, they actually use these SL2 techniques to control every path to every boundary. Yeah. But in some sense, they, they, they use holomorphicity. So they use that from a physics point of view that these are su super symmetric vacuum. Yeah. They also find that there are some algebraicity constraints on the, uh, on the, uh, on the low side of, of these Hodge classes. So the self-dual fluxes, which we consider, are in fact more general. They are not, while 2,2 fluxes are also self-dual, there are two, there are self-dual fluxes which are not Hodge classes. Yeah. So it's by no means clear that um, that still finiteness can be proved. And the way how we uh, we approached the we approach this, uh, and especially my math mathematics collaborators approach this, is we one connects uh, this question with this recent breakthrough by Bakker, Klingler, and Zimmermann, which relate Hodge theory with uh, tame topology. Thomas, you have uh, just a bit less than five minutes. Is that okay? Oh, yes. So, so what is the main result of their paper? Well, I, I, since I have very little time left, let me just sketch this very briefly. Well, the main result of their paper is that coset spaces of this type have a certain tame topology. So you can kind of cover them with, uh, with certain sets and they have nice finiteness properties. Furthermore, they showed that the period map, so also the, the thing which we heard about uh, quite a bit in the first two talks, have very special properties, namely it is tame near the boundaries. Yeah, it also has some certain mild behavior near the boundaries. And they have given an alternative proof to this famous theory of, of Catani, Deline, and Kaplan using exactly the fact that uh, there is this tame topology on these quotients, on these arithmetic quotients, and that the period map is tame near the boundaries. And this is what we want to use now for the more general question. And so what is the idea? Well, we, the idea is that the, the Hodge star is also living on a coset space, and deter, which is determined by the periods and the period map. And the G4 is living on a lattice. Yeah. And now one wants to show that there are only finitely many pairs which satisfy that uh, the Hodge star and G4 are satisfying the self-duality condition and that this inner product here, this G4 batch G4 is actually bounded. Yeah. And in other words, there are just fin finitely many pairs of subsets of the moduli space and in this lattice such that uh, you, can, uh, you can have a solution to the self-duality condition. But these, these self-dual loci, they can be of higher co-dimension. The, the important fact is that they are finitely many. Yeah. And in fact, this is uh, what we uh, 
what we what we can show using this technology and uh, and you you actually have a solid proof of this uh, result now and in the last part of this talk i want to use the success of this to suggest that there is in fact a general structure on the landscape which uh, which is such a uh, such a tame topology recently there has been a lot of discussion about the finiteness of the landscape let me just put the slide with some citations and the, of course this is a long uh, long lasting topic now what would be the idea well the idea is to kind of introduce some simple notion of finiteness starting from the real line so on the real line you would say well on the real line you would take finite subsets to be finitely many points or finitely many intervals or intervals which are infinitely long but they are just you then you just have finitely many of them yeah so all of this you would call finitely many sets one way to define this especially when you go to higher dimensions is to start saying that as uh, as coming from functions so a polynomial of course has only finitely many zeros but if you take a sine function it would have infinitely many zeros so in some sense you want to introduce a structure where polynomials are fine but sine functions are not fine right because for them you would get infinitely many uh, zeros and this is exactly what this all minimal structures do you know? i will not have time uh, to introduce them in detail but you can read this on my uh, slides later on if you want and that's what the mathematicians do they introduce some subsets of rn which are kind of closed under finite intersection and finite unions and so on and they include that the zeros of every polynomial to be part of such a structure yeah and now what is an o minimal structure an o minimal structure is exactly uh, a structure which has when you reduce this to the real line you only have a finite union of intervals so exactly what i have drawn to you in the previous slides as on the real line now you can define functions on these O minimal structures and uh, these functions then have these tame properties. So they have uh, very nice uh, uh, finiteness properties. So they, they map finite sets to other finite sets. Yeah. And in fact, this theory of O minimal structures gives a realization of, of Croton's dream of a tame topology and, and um, there is quite an extensive mathematical literature on this. The nice thing is one knows very non-trivial examples of this, of, of these O minimal structures, and they involve functions which we are very familiar from string theory, like when you have exponential correction, then you have these exponential functions. They can also construct, uh, con, uh, constr uh, construct an O minimal structure. The first note I want to make is what uh, was shown in the seminal paper is that the period map is exactly one of these special function with these tame properties. Yeah. And the nice uh, second note which I want to make is that the structure actually forbid uh, accumul accumulation points of zeros near uh, some special point. And this have been discussed in some papers some many years ago and then there were a lot of speculations what to do with them and the remarkable thing is at least in this setting uh, of Calabi-Yau manifolds such periods can such accumulation points can simply not occur yeah it's a very non-trivial it's a very non-trivial statement that they cannot occur and to close my talk I want to now uh, go away from this moduli space perspective with Calabi-Yau manifolds and uh, suggest that in fact the string theory landscape itself admits an O minimal structure and the conjecture then would read that the string vacuum landscape is exactly definable in such an O minimal structure. 
Well, we know that this conjecture can be true. Namely, it is true for Calabi-Yau manifolds and, uh, and their flux lattice. This brings me to the end. We have uncovered in the complex structure moduli space uh, a lot of structure using asymptotic Hodge theory. So there's no need to, no necessarily need to scan through Calabi-Yau examples. And we are ready to make general proofs. I have shown you that we can prove a highly non-trivial finiteness result for self to a flux vacua. And finally, I suggested to use this success to uh, propose an O-minimal structure for defining the string theory vacuum landscape or, or on the string theory vacuum landscape. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Thomas, for this very nice talk. Um, uh, questions? Andre? Oh, thank you, Thomas, for this very interesting talk. Um, so you talked about, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, you talked about three folds. Do you know anything similar for K3s? Any... Yes, yeah, so this can be also done for K3s. And in fact, for K3s, uh, uh, these kind of, for example, these classifications are even more well known in some sense, namely that they are kind of, uh, uh, the Kulin classification of, uh, of singularities of K3, a uh, Kulnikov uh, classification. Okay, thank you. And then related to the, uh, to the vacuum structure of string theory. So you mentioned, I, I, I don't know much about all minimal structures, but can you say something about the, the potentials, the moduli potentials that arise in string theory that they only have to contain certain kind of functions like monomial exponentials and things like this. Is that the statement that you're making? Yes, exactly. Yes. That's another way of formulating it. And, and you're absolutely right. That's the sort of statement which I want to make. Yes. Okay. Now, the, this is a, this is a very, uh, this is a very non-trivial statement, of course. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, that's exactly what happens here, right? That, the sort of functions which appear, namely the, the, the period map itself, is in fact not a general function, but a very special prom, prom function which has claim properties near the boundary. And my claim is that this is generally true for any function which can define, which can, which can give in string theory a potential. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Any okay. other questions for Thomas? Just please uh, unmute yourself and, and ask. If not, I have uh, one uh, question, which is actually your last uh, uh, line. Um, what can you say about non symmetric case? Well, I mean, so, so, so to understand the deepness of this, you have to realize that what these mathematicians have done is kind of they they have extracted out of this famous proof from the uh, Catani, uh, uh, Kaplan and Deline, kind of the part which is general, so to say, which is not related to holomorphicity. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and that's, if you ask me, that's the way to go if you want to, want to study non-supersymmetric situations. So this chain topology as you have seen in the second part of my talk, is entirely formulated over the real numbers. So that the holomorphicity doesn't play a central, no, plays no role in it. <laughs> okay, so, so very good. Finiteness plays a role, but holomorphicity doesn't. And that's, that's somehow the, um, that's the key new step. And, 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 and the hope would be to understand um, the next step is to understand what is the structure of this non-supersymmetric vacuum locus. So the vacuum locus is actually non-supersymmetric. Very nice. Okay, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, uh, let us uh, uh, thank you uh, one more time.